Great. So this resolution asks us whether it is wise or not for adolescent teenagers to postpone having sex or to engage in sex prior to the age of adulthood. I will highlight some key risks inherent in teenagers having sex. I will contend that it is wise counsel for teenagers to avoid these risks by obtain, abstaining from sex until they are older. Definitions. Lose their virginity. Having sex, the sort that could lead to pregnancy or an equivalent in physical intimacy. 18 plus, a rough stand-in for the age of adulthood in civil society. This is the age of sexual content, uh, consent and adulthood in most of the United States. The plus is uh, taken to mean adolescents could go up to longer than 18, but should last at least until 18. Should, the wisest course of action, what we encourage. The resolution asks whether teens should do, not what the government or greater society should do. Interpretation of burden. If pro can show that waiting to have sex until adulthood is the wisest counsel, then pro wins. If con can show that it is generally wiser to have sex prior to adulthood, then con should win. Ask yourself this, would I counsel a typical teen to wait until adulthood to have sex or not? Reasons for teen sex to delay sex. Pregnancy risk. All according to the CDC statistics, teen pregnancy is about 6% in the range of 750,000 pregnancies per year. Teen abortion, around 30% of teens will result, uh, pre pregnancies will result in abortion. Teen birth, around 2% in the range of 230,000 incidents per year. Birth impacts, reduced income, reduced education, increased depression, increased rates of suicide, higher incidence of welfare dependency, higher rates of birth complications, higher rates of child neglect. STD risks, STD transmission rates are at an all high, high and highest among teenagers. Teens are 20% of sexually active population, but account for 50% of new STD cases and transmissions. One in four teens contract sexually transmitted diseases every year. This is due to low rates of condom use, around 30%, and low rates of STD testing among teenagers. Competing priorities. Teens should be focused on school, learning, and establishing the skills they need in life. Intense sexual relationships distract from these priorities. It is also a poor time to performing committed relationships because futures are so uncertain when you're a teenager. This can lead to either heartache or unfortunate compromises in career and life ambitions. Therefore, it is better to abstain. Religious beliefs. The religions of many teenagers and families of teenagers see sex outside of marriage as something to avoid. And finally, statutory rape risks. Teenagers engaged in sex are at higher risk for statutory rape in some states, and uh, their nominally consensual partners are also at risk for prosecution. In summary, adolescent teenagers should not have sex because doing so exposes them to many significant life-altering risks such as teen pregnancy, STD infection, less focus on schools, violation of religious beliefs, and the risk of statutory rape. Khan needs to show us that having sex is better. Certainly. Uh, thank you for that eloquent introduction. Just before I get started in my kind of opening statements, I just wanted to clarify something from your definition. So you'd say that we'd rather encourage uh, children to wait in, until they're 18 to, to have sex. Would you say that this encouragement would take form of like, or, or would you support this encouragement taking form of a kind of society wide norm against people under the age of 18 having sex in the same way that we would uh, say that there is a norm that discourages people from smoking? Uh, I suppose so, but that's not my focus. My focus is what advice should we give to teens? That's, that's totally legitimate. I think that um, we should consider that if this is something that we're willing to stand by, uh, tell teenagers that we need to consider <clears throat> that there are some social ramifications and fallouts from those, which I'll be addressing a little bit later. But uh, on to my opening statements. So I believe that, uh, that first of all, as a, as a kind of uh, prima facie thing to note, that uh, people under the age of 18 are capable of having uh, healthy, consensual sexual experiences. And I think that there's a couple of criteria that we can look at to prove this. The first, the, the, the basic criteria that I'm going to look at is that the two things that are required to have a consenting, mutually enjoyable sexual experience is that first, you are capable of giving consent. And that secondly, that you both people are willingly and enthusiastically engaged in that sexual intercourse. Given that most teenagers tend to lose their virginity before the age of 18, I think the average sits at about 17. So uh, you would uh, assume that there is a high number of people having sex even, even younger than that to pull that average down. I think it's safe to say that many of the teens want to be able to have these sexual encounters. And so really the only question is, are they capable of consenting? I think I'm going to point to two things. Firstly, the fact that they have advanced enough mental capacities that we recognize by making them, putting them in a stage of life where they're already making a lot of life decisions about 
what subjects to take in school, potentially looking at trying to apply for colleges. All of these things have far more drastic impacts on their futures than just just choosing whether or not to have sex with someone. And yet we already uh, allow them to make those decisions. So I think it's a fair enough assumption to say that we that they're uh, capable of mentally understanding the process that is going behind consenting into a sexual uh, you know event. Um, and also the fact that by the age of about 15 or 16, most people have kind of finished going through puberty, which means that their body, sexually speaking, is that of an adult and is something that they are able to feel those urges within them and understand uh, how those reciprocal urges could exist in other people. So I think fundamentally, teens are capable of, of uh, consenting to have sex at least by age, say, 16 or so. Why do I think that there are benefits to doing it uh, before you're 18? A couple of things. Firstly, the earlier you start having sex, the more sex that you're able to have. Sex is a good thing. Lots of people like doing it. The more that you get, that is a plus. Secondly, there's there's an age in which it's acceptable to be bad at uh, having sex, and that age uh, get, is... is um, geared towards the younger the older you get way before you lose your virginity the more awkward it is and the more social cost that you impose on yourself at being bad at being able to do it the earlier that you're able to kind of work out those kinks work out that sort of like you know uh that that inherent sort of uh inexperience that you have uh with your own body and with the body of your partner the more confident and and um able to sort of like project yourself as an adult you are able to be i think that the longer that people wait the more that that becomes harmful because the first time they have a sexual experience they're bad at it when they are expected to be good at it because they're an adult and that has significant harms upon them i'll address some of my your material in my next speech but i'll pass it back to you <clears throat> sure so let's talk about that first of all you mentioned that uh is key. And here's the thing, legally in the United States, people under the age of 18 are not allowed or able, considered able under the law to give consent. That's why there are statutory rape laws in every state in the United States. So the idea is that there are many situations when you're a teenager, your lack of life experience, um, difficulty in processing sexual things because it's your first time, that you are not able to legally give consent to another person in order to have sex because you haven't achieved the level of maturity needed to fully understand the outcomes of your decisions. And that is evidenced by all the higher risks and damaging outcomes that teens face in sex. The reason teen pregnancy is bad is not because pregnancy is bad overall, it's because pregnancy as a teenager is especially harmful, has a lot of risks to both mother and child. So therefore you're not able to deal with the consequences of the choice that you're making um, until you're older and adult and able to handle these responsibilities in our current society. Now you say that teenagers are smart enough. Uh, here's the turn on that. And that's because, yes, they're making life decisions right now about what their careers and jobs are going to be. That's because they have to, because if you reach your age of adulthood, you need to achieve self-sufficiency in the financial workplace. They don't have to start a family just yet. That is not imperative at that time. And distracting them with sexual relationships, the ability to have children, STDs, and other complications are going to distract from the important life choices that they're already engaged in and that they have to be engaged in as where these other life choices about sexual relationships can be delayed a little bit later until you start to establish a career and you've completed your education. That is the wise course of action to deal with one serious issue at a time rather than trying to tackle them all at once when you're too young. Um, they have the body of an adult and well, I agree that is partly true, or at least true for the most part. I do not think it is relevant because we're talking about social decision-making, not physical capability here. Um, the benefits, you say more sex is better, but here's the problem. There's another turn on this because if you engage in sex and end up encountering some of these negative outcomes, you will have a lot less sex. If you get pregnant as a teenager uh, and you become trapped in a relationship or you end up committing suicide or you're responsible for caring for a child, you're actually going to enjoy sex a lot less a little later in life. You'll have less opportunities. It is better to avoid these risks, wait a little bit longer, and then have a fuller, more robust sexual life with less risk and less danger to yourself that could end all kinds of enjoyment for you, not just having more sex. Um, you say that there's a social cost to losing your virginity, but that doesn't necessarily be so. And you can avoid those social contexts uh, just by lying if you need to. You talk about training, but there's a time and place for training. And teens should date. They should have relationships with these kissing, maybe some fondling and other activities as they build up towards sexual relationships rather than just jumping into the deep end right away. Uh, think of it as training wheels. You should ride on the training wheels for a while before you take them off and ride the bicycle. So you should wait until you're 18. 
Yeah, I also agree that foreplay is important and, you know, teens should probably engage in that before jumping straight in. Let's just talk about some of the harms that you guys, uh, that, that you've sort of brought up. Uh, I think the, the biggest two that you've addressed are, are STDs uh, and pregnancy. The, the main thing I'd like to point out here is that those are not harms that are inherent to sexual uh, interactions insofar as that not every sexual interaction that you have has to be able to lead to that. And in fact, many people are capable of doing so without uh, having these consequences because they are able to adequately use contraception and adequately use protection to be able to prevent themselves from, from catching STDs and, and uh, falling pregnant. I think that most of those problems that you have identified would be able to be solved if we were able to implement uh, ubiquitous uh, safe sex standards through both education and access to the materials themselves to teens across the country. Uh, but here's where I want to sort of identify um, the, the one of the harms that I think that you brought up by saying that you'd support a kind of norm where we discourage children, uh, teens below the age of 18 from having sex, is that given that the average age of having sex is 16 and, and 17, as, as kind of dictated by, you know, statistics and stuff, that means that even if we would have this cancel out, there would be a lot of people who are still having that sex. And you want them to be able to access safe sex and you want them to be able to access birth control so that they don't have these negative externalities that you've identified. But you make that harder when you have a norm that says, no, you should just wait to 18. And the way that you can see this is because if you look at states in the United States where abstinence only education uh, is, is the standard instead of uh, being, you know, educating about access to contraception, you see that rates of teen pregnancy are actually higher in those states than areas where you're able to access those contraceptions. So I think that, and, and, and just generally speaking, right, if there is a norm against teens accessing those kind of contraceptions, then it makes it harder for teens to go to places like Planned Parenthood to say, I need contraception because I'm thinking of becoming sexually active. It becomes harder for them to talk to their teachers or their, uh, their family about, I need access to this contraception because I'm thinking about having sexually, uh, becoming sexually active. It becomes harder for them to go to doctors and get a regular STD checkups and try to early diagnose and get medicine to treat those things because there is a norm against them doing so and they feel an intense amount of discouragement and shame from being able to do so. So I think that overall that it would be beneficial if we recognize that given that, and, and going on to my earlier uh, points, that given that most people start thinking and start wanting to have sex at around age 16, that if we just admitted, look, this is the age where people are wanting to do it, that's fine, that's natural. If you become pregnant, if you get an STD, that's obviously a bad thing, but there are many steps that you can take to try to avoid those things. So let's focus on the education and the distribution of those means so that uh, people can engage in healthy, consensual, uh, mutually pressurable uh, sexual interactions without having those negative externalities. You also say that this kind of distracts from school and stuff. I'll talk about this more later, but I think you can just have sex and also be focused on your school. It doesn't take a huge amount of your time out. All right, so let's talk through this, uh, talk about harms in this case, since I, I rebutted the, the first lines of argument. So now we're going to talk about this uh, question of uh, risk. So uh, saying uh, that, you know, these things can be prevented. And yes, that's absolutely true. But the inherent nature of teenagers is that they're a little bit less responsible. They have multiple things going on in their lives for the first time, and they're discovering stuff. Uh, they tend to be a little bit on the rebellious side. And we see that in lower rates of condom use among teenagers than in adults, uh, higher rates of risky sexual behavior among teenagers than adults, and as a result, higher risk of uh, higher rates of STD transmission and uh, higher rates of unwanted pregnancy. And so we know that there are these inherent risks in teenagers. Not every teenager gets pregnant or gets an STD, of course. Now, about half of the people who are sexually active do end up with an STD as a teenager because of these risky behaviors. Um, so that's a pretty high one. Pregnancy is considerably lower, but it has a much more serious impact. When you're weighing risks, you're always weighing a chance of happening versus impact. And we know among teenagers, these things are at higher incidence. So it is a time at which you should be avoiding these behaviors uh, because other people, the, your partners, you cannot, you can control your own responsibility, but you cannot control your partner's responsibility. And so uh, generally speaking, you're still at high risk. Therefore, it is still good advice to wait. Now, maybe you think you've got all your ducks in a row, you can go ahead and do something, but that's not the general advice we're gonna give the typical teenager. That would be specific to an individual who gets to make their own decisions. This is about what advice we would give as to the wisest course of action. Um, now you talk about sexual norms. Now, first of all, I have not advocated for any particular norms in this debate. Education, good education about sexual prevention is still important for teenagers when they get to 18 and important for those who choose to ignore the advice about abstinence. We're just talking about whether or not we're going to offer this advice. You should probably refrain from sex until you're an adult. Um, to say that we shouldn't say that 
because it might create a social norm that would lead less people to advise people to, as to good contraception use uh, is outside the scope of the debate. We can still absolutely teach safe sex, good sexual practices, and we absolutely should because they will need those skills as they enter adulthood, and they will need those skills if they decide to ignore our other piece of advice and give in to temptations of sex. And that is okay. We should cover both bases. We should always give the best, wisest advice that we have available to the next generation. And that's all I'm advocating here today. So it's not mutually exclusive. We should never throw out good advice just because it could be misused. And it is not a question of what we should focus on. I'm not saying we should focus on abstinence education. I'm just saying that part of our teaching of good practice would be it is wisest for you as a teenager to wait to have sexual intercourse until you're an adult and you can better handle the responsibility of it. That's all. Um, let's just deal with this idea of an opportunity cost, because I get that in the abstract that you can say, we can say both of these things, but I want to really hammer in on what that would look like in like a practical setting, because I think that you'll, if you think about it for a moment, you'll see that there is in fact an opportunity cost to try to purvey these two conflicting messages. Because if, for example, you're saying the way that we're giving this counsel out is in a school setting, right? Where you have like a, 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 a health teacher who's saying, look, we think that abstinence is the wisest court of action, but also here's all these other ways that that if you do decide to have sex, that you're able that you're able to protect yourself. That that really comes apart as a mixed message. And if you do want this to actually, if you stand by this being the healthiest way uh, or, or the the most the wisest counsel, as you say, to to put towards teens, then it seems somewhat incompatible that you would offer these two conflicting messages because you water down the benefit of one message by saying that. But we we you know it's like oh, here's this lip service that we're going to pay to this idea that you should wait until you're 18. But of course, we all know that you're going to do it. So here's actually how you do it safely, right? I think that that is that, that, that unless you're willing to stand by your message and say, no, this is the thing that we're going to offer as the kind of sole advice, or at least the most dominant narrative, then that is the kind of thing that, that, um, that we're going to stand behind. But also then sort of just moving on to um, my earlier points about the way that this creates a kind of norm within the system. Because if, again, like if, if you stand behind this message, you do have to engage in sort of perpetuating it and pushing it to some degree. And if that is the kind of official byline of teachers, of the educational system, of, of adults who are kind of giving these cancels to teens, then of course that kind of creates uh, a, a, a norm within that, that sort of uh, teenage society that people who abstain from that uh, advice or people who, you know, uh, go against it are doing something wrong or are doing something that is worthy of scorn and of shame. Because I would offer you the analogous situation that we put at, at the moment of saying that like, well, we think smoking is bad and you, you shouldn't in fact smoke, right? That is the official line that has been taken by health educators, that has been taken by adults when, when it is put towards by teens. And because of that, there is a fair amount of stigma and shame that is associated with people uh, who who are teenagers who smoke. And so I think that you have to look at that there would likely be an analogous situation. And because of that, uh, that, that uh, stigma that you perpetuate about these acts, if you are going to push this message, then it makes it much, much harder for you to be able to uh, harm mitigate against all of those things. Because what, what I want to uh, take away from here is that if you are able to effectively mitigate the risk of pregnancy, and if you are able to effectively mitigate the risk of STDs, then those are the two harms that you have identified as being negative fallout from uh, from a sexual experience. If those things can be mitigated to the point where they are no longer conten contentions, then it's all good from there. People are having in mutually enjoyable uh, sexual experiences with one another, and and so we should be fine with that. And you take away from the efficacy of being able to perpetuate that if this is the official line that you're taking of abstinence. Uh, let me start with the very end of what you said, because I think it's problematic. You're sort of saying if in a perfect world we can eliminate all these risks by getting everybody to behave responsibly all the time, then it wouldn't be a problem. And yes, that's true. If everyone behaved responsibly all the time, then we wouldn't have any problems. But that is not the nature of life. We grow up. We start out as a child. We learn how to behave. We become wiser and wiser the older we get. And, uh, you know, it takes time and experience in order to learn things. And, uh, you know, you can't just sort of magically wave a wand and say in a perfect world, none of these things would be a problem. We don't live in a perfect world. People are not perfect. Uh, these are not the thing, way things work. Um, we have to have wise counsel that helps people guide these issues. And we know from experience that teenagers will tend to make poor decisions. And they're not, let's be frank, all going to follow our advice uh, that they should wait until they're adults to lose their virginity. Of course not. And they're not going to all take our advice when we tell them to use a condom 
or when we tell them to be careful about pregnancy or anything else that we advise them to, right? But we have to do our best to offer this information and hope and trust them that they will make the best decisions possible for themselves, right? So we can't just eliminate all risks. We have to give people all the tools necessary to guide themselves through life. Um, you say it's a mixed message, but it really does not have to be. There's actually quite a lot of confluence. If you simply teach it, here are the risks of sex. You teach people about sex. You teach people about the wonderful, great things about sex. You also teach them about the risks and the dangers of sexuality. And then you give them all the information they need to protect themselves. That includes uh, abstinence, which is a way that you could avoid all the risks completely, but you don't get any of the benefits. You can uh, teach them about condom use, which is the best way to avoid STD transmission. You can teach them about other forms of birth control, which are actually more effective at birth control than condoms are. Um, so you can give them all the tools necessary and you can give them the best advice. You say, look, these tools, if you're going to engage in sex, use the best tools. If you don't engage in sex, you don't need any of these tools, uh, you will be risk-free from the uh, risks of sex, but you will wanna have sex when you're ready for it. And so here are all the tools necessary that when the time comes, you will be prepared. There is no reason we cannot teach all of those things all at the same time and give people the best advice and the most information in order to live their lives. And that's what I'm saying. Black and white thinking this like we can't do that because, well, some people will screw it up is not a way to go forward, right? We want to have the best of everything. We want to do the best we can. We give the most information that we can, and we give the wisest counsel that we can. And we should not be afraid that wisdom will be misused. We have to put it out there. Sometimes that is a risk that we have to take. But generally speaking, these things are going to confluence together and be a great overall message for teenagers to both enjoy sex when they choose to engage in it and to choose a wise time to engage in it, which are both very important. This is not a moral judgment. This is about wisdom, good decision-making, and achieving the best outcomes in your life. And we should emphasize that that is the point, not moral condemnation. I just want to take a moment to highlight what I think is a bit of a tension in your case, right? Because you say that teenagers are, are inherently poor decision makers and you've evidenced things like their low root use of, of condoms and, and other sort of things like that and the fact that they had not yet fully developed adults but then you also take this position that as long as we equip them with all of the tools that are necessary in order to make these decisions then they ultimately will make these good decisions i just don't think that that is the right characterization of teens and this is where i circle back on my point about why there is a real opportunity cost to trying to have this best of both worlds um, circumstance i think that the teen that, that teens and, and their decision making at that age, because they, as you have correctly identified, have not fully developed their own rational, critical thinking, uh, uh, you know, capacities where they're able to weigh up all bits of information, are very easily influenced by norms, are very in easily influenced by social pressure. And if you see the way that, like, you know, teens are the first people to catch on to all of, like, you know, you know, like fads and trends and, and all these sorts of things and, and dive into them wholeheartedly. You see that there is very much a kind of herd mentality that goes where, where people are just kind of looking at their peers and trying their best to fit in and fit in with what is the, the, the currently acceptable behavior, that that is the kind of decision-making process that teens are making. And because of that, that is why I think that there is a real harm to try to have this best of both worlds narratives to say, well, sex is good and here are the ways that you avoid it, but also you shouldn't do it. But also it's fine if you do these things, but also don't do it. That comes apart as a really confusing uh, message to teens and it becomes something where they're unable and, and they're less likely to access the kind of things that we want them to access so that they can avoid the risks of things like pregnancy and things like STDs. Now, I understand that you also make the case that where you say, look, even if though we can't 100% ensure against those things, that it's better that people wait until later in life, because if they do fall pregnant or if they do get an STD, it's better that they do that when they're 18 as opposed to when they're 16. To which I would like to respond that I don't think that there is a significant difference in the, in the amount that a pregnancy or an STD disrupts your life when you are 18 as opposed to when you are 16. Yes, you may have finished higher schooling, but you've still yet to find stable employment. If you're looking at going into something like college, you're still unable, you still haven't yet, you know, fully started, uh, you know, going through that process of higher education. And so having to like, you know, nail down and start a family or trying to deal with this, like having a baby while also getting additional schooling is just as disruptive as if you were doing it in high school. So I don't think that uh, at saying, you know, if we're saying that people should wait until it, it, they're, um, they're ready in life to accept all the possibility of the consequences, people really shouldn't be having sex until they're about 25 to 30, right? 
Obviously, that's an unrealistic circumstance. So I take the burden that people should have sex as as soon as they are able to consent and able to participate in mutually enjoyable sexual experiences. And I think that the way that you ensure against all of those harms is giving a clear, undiluted message as much as possible that this is the way that you have safe sex and this is how you should engage with it. It would be very poor guides in life if we uh, decide that the people listening to us cannot process good advice and wisdom and information, right? It is beholden upon us to teachers and advisors to give the best information possible and the most information possible. What people do with that uh, tends to be their own consequence and their own responsibility, right? So if we don't tell people it is wise to wait until they are 18 to lose their virginity, which it most certainly is wise to do, as I've demonstrated by multiple points and multiple risks, uh, then we are giving bad advice. So we should not mislead people or omit useful information that some people might take advantage of. Just because every teenager will not engage in abstinence does not mean we should not make the advice available to those who would follow that wise counsel. And around 20% of teenagers do manage to get through high school without having sex. So uh, by we should give that advice because it is the wisest advice. We're here to decide whether or not the advice is wise, not whether or not teenagers will follow it, right? This is not a solvency case because uh, fiat would include the agent of action. In this case, the agent of action is the teenager. So if the teenager follows this advice, Will they get better outcomes or not? I've shown for multiple reasons why the outcomes are much worse if they engage in sex before their adulthoods because there's higher risk of STDs, because religion prohibits it, um, because there's a, the impacts of teen pregnancy are really high, um, because they could be in trouble for statutory rape, um, and uh, uh, and because they're taking away the folks from their schoolwork and their career choices and other things that they should be focused on. For all these reasons, it is wiser to wait until you have sex, until you have these other things sorted out. And these other risks are lower because your partners are more responsible, you're more responsible, better able to make decisions, and so on. That's what we're deciding here today. The whole issue of whether teens will follow this advice or not is kind of a different deal. Now, you say uh, there's two worlds that we could look at, one where they follow our advice and they have good outcomes, or ones where they ignore our advice and end up engaging in risky behavior. Which is better? Well, obviously the one where they follow our advice. And that tells us that the advice is good. That doesn't mean that everybody is necessarily going to follow it. Uh, you say the teens are maybe too stupid to understand all these messages. I would say the teens are not dumb. They're just high risk behavior actors. And they're a little overwhelmed by all the things that they're learning in life. It's, a, it's all kinds of information that's brand new bombarding you as a teenager. That's what makes life really kind of overwhelming. Um, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't make good advice and good information available to them, right? That's just the challenge of being a teenager. It's one of the reasons to wait until you've settled out many of other life's challenges. You can have this other challenge that you can tackle a little bit later in life and it will be more rewarding for you and better off overall. Now, uh, you talk about STD disruption not being higher, and that's a little bit of a false dichotomy. The risk of STDs is much higher as you're a teenager. The impact is not. However, with pregnancy, the risk of pregnancy is much higher as a teenager. So these are the inherent risks. Pregnancy, it's about impact. With STDs, it is about likelihood because teens are less responsible about the behaviors needed to prevent STD transmission. Therefore, you should not engage with other teens, even if you happen to be very responsible. Part of what constitutes wise advice is not just how much sort of truth or wisdom is contained within it, but also how much of that is actually being able to be delivered to the recipient of said advice. If, by your own characterization, these teens are unlikely to be able to listen to this advice, unlikely to make these decisions that we that you, that you project to be good decisions, then I would say that uh, pursuing along this line where we just say, don't uh, engage in this activity, and even if we know that they're going to do it in the first place, is not good advice, and that we would be much better use of our time trying to promote uh, healthy and safe sexual encounters, because we know that they're going to engage in this activity. And so the best thing that we can do is try to promote a narrative that uh, takes away from the potential harms of that activity. So just in a closing statement, the thing that I would like to identify is that all of the um, the risks and the harms that you've identified with teens having sex before their age of 18 are easily mitigated and, and something that can be better mitigated by the proportion of a uh, counter narrative to the one that you were promoting. That's things like uh, safe access to birth control, safe access to regular uh, uh, doctor checkups so that they can do things like STDs, um, 
but uh, both of those things can can uh, effectively mitigate, if not completely eliminate, the risk of pregnancy and STDs within those sexual encounters. You also talk about things like disruption to life. I already said that I don't think that disruption is significantly more uh, when you're 16 as opposed to when you're 18. You also talk about statutory rape. That's an issue of laws. Laws can be changed. As here in Australia, there's a g- age between like uh, if if you're a 16 year old engaging in sexual contact with another 16 year old, it's not considered statutory rape. You're fine. It's we we could adopt similar laws in countries like that. But just to issue on some other closing. Uh, some other statements. I think that it is beneficial for teenagers to engage within sexual uh, contact with one another at an age where they are capable of consenting and understanding and mutually agreeing to what is going on. And the reason why I think that promotes an inherent benefit is because it enables people to be more confident and more comfortable with their own bodies and the bodies of other people. And that has ongoing benefits as you promote later in life. And that the earlier that you are able to sort of go on that journey of self-discovery and figure out like how you work, what it is you like, what it is that you can do to make other people that you want to make feel good, feel good, the more confident rounded an adult that you are able to be. That becomes harder as you move later in life, as the social cost of being a virgin becomes higher and higher. That is why it is better to engage in those at an earlier age when mistakes are much more teens, I think, should have sex earlier than 18. It doesn't take long to advise somebody abstinence, which is a wise course when you're learning in life.